Hello, everyone. Uh, if you could please turn off any mobile phones and noisemakers before we get started, that'd be great. Uh, but I think it's time to get into my talk, which is architecture for level design. Um, I'm Claire Hosking. I've got a master's of architecture and a bachelor's of design in architecture. Um, I've written for Polygon in the past, and I make my own games based on procedural architecture and that kind of thing. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you today is about how level designers, how architectural design can help level designers achieve their intended mood and add depth to their levels. And since I don't know what kind of activities you want to put in your game, I'm going to presume that it's not going to be combat necessarily or puzzles or story pickups. I'm just going to focus on making individual spaces worthwhile. Uh, so the first thing I was thinking about um, when making this talk is what would be most useful to you because architecture covers a lot of different things. Um, so what I really want to focus on is the kind of geometry and layout design that level designers do and how you can use that to kind of emphasize and accentuate materials and all those later stages um, of the design process. Uh, so, uh, whoops, wrong button. So, basic considerations. One of the, the great uh, qualities that brings mood to space and to cities um, is the typology of cities. The typology of cities is the kind of the layout of the city and the pattern that it adopts in response to all the considerations that um, people have around them. So the weather, uh, the topology, all of that kind of thing. But all of these things tend to relate to some basic considerations about space, circulation, psychological comfort, and visual interest. So this is from a 1979 study by urbanist uh, William H. White called The Street Life Project. Uh, they went out and studied and mapped how people use public space. And they produced an excellent documentary called The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, which I'd really recommend uh, watching if you ever want to create a city as part of your level design. And what they found is that when people are standing or sitting, they tend to pull back towards the edge of spaces. They like to put their back against something safe, and they like to look outwards towards a vista. And interestingly, the most interesting vista for them to watch is other people. And we also know that when people want to go between two places, they go in a straight line. So one of the most successful urban spaces has a main direct route between two paths, which has people all walking along it. And then at the edges, it has somewhere for people to sit. And then behind that, it has a defined edge. And people will come there and like sit there and watch the world go by. And if it's a less linear space, say more of a plaza or a park, uh, you can put other activities as a central focus, like a fountain or an ice cream cart or a ball game, etc. Uh, and people will take the focus if there's something for them to do. And this typology tends to repeat itself at all levels. So a room is organized around a focus, those rooms organize around a focus, houses cluster around a street or a square, um, and plazas and cities like kind of organize around the center of the city. Um, and you can break up all of those into small units of implied rooms and that kind of thing. So if you're looking to make like passively interesting space in a game that functions like real spaces do, you can use this. And so if the player is a spectator, they go to the edge. And if they're a traveler or an activator, they go to the center. Um, architects tend to summarize these factors uh, into the idea of positive and negative space. So positive space um, is this well-defined uh, space that has like an organizing focal point. And negative space tends to be leftover space, ill-defined, often concave space with no real um, organizing focal point or axis. And roughly, people feel comfortable in positive space, and they tend to move on and feel a bit uncomfortable in negative space. Uh, so this also works in video games. So here's a good example from The Walking Dead, uh, where negative space is used to kind of disconcert the player. It's not just uh, the emptiness and the abandoned cars and the sickly green tinge, like the art direction, that's producing the sense of desolateness here. Um, there's this amorphous, ill-defined space of the suburbs uh, that creates a sense of unease and that you want to move along from. And the urban design has no direction to it, and that's perfect because this is a particular part in this game where the player doesn't know where they should go. And so this is kind of showing you that it's like the, the, the layout itself creates the mood. It's not just the accoutrements of home, which already feel very familiar. Um, it's kind of the, the space that you move through that's able to set a lot of the tone. Um, so in order to do this, um, William talked a little bit about how architects use the, the idea of a party, which is a diagram that shows the organization of space. And it can show just the physical layout of space, but it can also express kind of the tonal layout of space and um, what, what approach you'll be using. So this is by Peter Zumthor. It's the party for the thermal baths at Vals, uh, which is generally regarded as, as a modern masterpiece of mood and tone. 
Uh, so it establishes, the original diagram establishes the sense of heaviness that he's trying to achieve, which translates into these rooms that are designed as like solid blocks that have been inserted into the plan and then smaller spaces carved out of them. So the, the layout itself has a solidity to it that is then reinforced by the, the way the materials have been treated and the layout itself allows the materials to be treated like that. Um, so party helps you consider if you want the qualities of your space to be like boxy or amalgamations or iconic or woven or folded or piled up and the way that affects the way the player interacts with the world and the qualities of space and play. So architecture creates meaning through atmosphere rather than symbolism as I was talking before about the focus of um, the uh, domestic qualities. Um, it's not so much about like you can see that the houses have gabled roofs and that kind of thing. It's more about um, the uh, geometry, the material, the texture, creating like quite a domestic space that sets a necessary tone for the audience, um, like if that was something that you wanted to achieve. So here's a, a really good example. This is also by Peter Zontho, um, who is a well-known architect. He's won uh, the Pritzker Prize, which is like the big You're a Great Architect Prize. Uh, it's a lifetime award. Um, for your work. He's also one of my favorite architects. Um, and so this is Bruder Klaus Field Chapel. Um, this is a chapel for shepherds. It's in the middle of a field. There's no way that you can like put priests in it or um, put bells or any of that kind of thing to tell you what it's for. So how does Zumthor use space and like design and that kind of thing to create something that feels like suitably sacred and draw people to it? So firstly, um, rather than create a steeple and a pitched roof with a cross on top, it uses this warm and mysterious form to attract people. Uh, I think this was something that Journey understood really well, is it's one thing to make it really clear where your player has to go, but it's another thing to make it really inviting. Um, and in order to like, get people to go somewhere, as an architect, I can't use horror or urgency. Um, I can't damsel their loved ones or give people fetch quests. Um, so Zumthor chooses a strategy that's much more about sneak peeks and arousing curiosity about what's up there and how the next corner might change your perceptions. So this curiosity here is created by the tapered corners which show the mass and make it obvious that there's something in there inviting us to circle around. It's very relative, but in our culture, uh, this kind of simple unit with shallow angles can have a kind of arcane connotations. Uh, you can see this used in like other chapels, but also video games that are trying to like go for something that feels quite otherworldly. Um, it's this, yeah, this flip, it, in the Rothko Chapel, it's used to kind of generate this platonic ideal of worship that is transcendent across different religions. Um, and so, yeah, these geometries kind of hint at otherworldliness. Uh, so similarly, it leaves off decorative detail. And while detail is used a lot in games to do environmental storytelling and to clue players into what era and class um, your world is set in, uh, leaving it off, likewise, like creates the ambiguity and the mystery here that's drawing you towards it, because you don't know how modern or ancient it might be, what culture or group it belongs to just yet. And likewise, the soft indents and texture are beautifully human-scaled, um, and that kind of plays into like having left all that off and having used quite simple forms, it allows that to shine. All right. Uh, rather than use a more traditional church or cathedral door, um, some people use this almost this sci-fi door. And in a nice piece of attention directing, like rather than using kind of the red flashing light where the detail kind of shows you where the door is, the door is actually pointing you towards the detail. Um, because like this is not about like knowing where the next place to go is, it's about taking in um, each point along your journey. And so, so far, it's used kind of the position, the color, the shaping, the formal arrangement of the dots on the outside to express that there's something here, it contains something, and that is Christian. And it's when then the next step is that you step inside, and it's full of stars. This is probably, these are all the little holes that are left over when you build um, something out of concrete. You have to put ties through between both sides of the formwork. And Zumthor has chosen to leave them open to create this kind of, this sense of uh, infinite space um, and like deep kind of meaningfulness. Uh, it's probably the most literally holy chapel in the world. Uh, <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> and as you can see, uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, traditional Christian chapel symbolism, no boats, no fish, no doves. Uh, instead, the architecture itself uh, points directly at the sky, the sloping fluted walls carry the eye upwards, and the dark starry interior suggests an endless universe. And you can see like the thick, heavy walls and poured uh, iron covering on the floor, which you might be able to see there, um, create this sense of like meditative weightiness that settles the space and encourages you to dwell. So the form making itself like, yeah, it accentuates all these materials that have come in, and it creates an experience for the player, like, all on its own. Um, so the carved space cannot be taken from one vantage point. It's impossible to stand back and find one position where the whole space is framed. It pushes you too close. So you have to actively construct a mental image of the space, and it can only exist inside your head. And this itself kind of gestures towards the ephemeral and, like, the idea of something that exists but exists on a different plane. And so, yeah, so this is how architecture can create a sense of space without necessarily, oh, without necessarily all the symbolism. And there are games that do this really well, too. So, for instance, if you look at the way that the idea of home is portrayed in Last of Us and Soma, uh, you might notice the first level layouts, I've only got the Last of Us here, unfortunately, uh, you might notice that the first level layouts are rectilinear, not much interpenetration or variation in the volumes, pretty clean, simple, familiar, generic. But importantly, that sense of order is echoed in the way the architecture is constructed, where you have these solid joints, simple cornices, simple skirtings, all very matte. So thematically, it establishes a locus of order that acts as a contrast to the oncoming disorder, which will be characterized by a very different set of tectonics, that of encrustation. And so here, you can see that like, both the level layouts and like, the world itself become like, these very melded level layers of material, these knobbly surfaces, this rust and dirt and moss and mold. And at the, yeah, so at the same time that the level layouts become less rectilinear, um, like the, it's used to kind of highlight this art. And so this is a great example where the construction of the architecture echoes the level design, uh, how the mood is established both in organizing principle and material expression of the space in a way that has storytelling purpose. So creating specific characters in a space. Here, two things have to evolve at once, since the way you shape a space can emphasize materials, and simultaneously the perception of material qualities, that is weight, sturdiness, complexity, etc., um, influences the perception of shape and scale and proportion, the kinds of things that you have control over in shaping your levels. Uh, so this is an example uh, by Zaha Hadid of um, how the layout of the space is helping to highlight the tonal qualities of material. Uh, Hadid is also a Pritzker Prize winner, also a, a major worldwide architect, um, also a favorite of mine. Um, she mainly works in digital architecture. She does a lot of procedural stuff um, and works a lot in concrete, not so much in steel, which is why this one is kind of interesting. So, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so here to create an appropriate atmosphere for the activity of diving, uh, she's designed a set of boards that kind of fill you, fill you with the feeling of lightness even before you step off the edge. Level design-wise, it's been separated into these individual podiums, like creating a journey that requires you to step out onto these suspended stairways. And it's not like traditional diving boards, um, which are joined into this like, se se central column and you don't get to actually step out and experience that space. Uh, the space has also been cleared of other distracting elements and the ceiling is quite high and the, the walls are without many right angles, so it creates this sense of smoothness. Moreover, the same level sensibi lay layout sensibility is echoed in the way the materials have been treated and shaped. So the steel forms these light, fine railings. You can see they return in these curved um, details that are set apart from the platform. The concrete has been shaped to these very plastic forms. So the mood of the layout and the mood of the materials and the way they meet each other all have this sensibility. And the choice that um, Zaha has made has allowed this to occur. So there are games that do this really well, where the spatial qualities create tone and emphasize materiality. Uh, the first two Bioshock games, where the construction details are these chunky pieces really solidly welded together. And if you look at the level maps, you can see chunky spaces with like heavy duty connections between them. And this makes sense because it's a heavy place, um, weighed down by a lot of atmospheric pressure. Uh, so yeah, it's the actual layout of the space and how you move through it. And you can't just reskin this and expect it to work really well in all fictions. So. Bioshock Infinite takes a similar sensibility, but again, it still feels weighty even though it's meant to be in the sky. 
so in architecture, you would look more for using details and material rather than like narrative fiction in order to create a sense of lightness. So this is the Holman House by Durback Blockjackers, uh, which there are details like there are reflective mirrors on the columns. Uh, the lights seem to fall through this from the sky through holes in the ceiling, and the windows continue down past the edge of the floor. So there's a sense that the whole building is kind of floating even when you're in it. Uh, there are games that do this well. So Mirror's Edge uh, is trying to create a really light feeling um, that you're traversing things. Um, and they aren't very bound, welded. Sorry, I'm talking too fast. They're not welded together, but sit apart, uh, sit apart, sharply defined. The space around you almost seems free-floating. Um, subtracted, boxy elements insert themselves into your path and fragment space. Steel is used not just because it's visually light, um, but it creates these fences that are blades jutting up into the level, and that moves the camera up and down very quickly and enhances that sense that you're up in the air and you're kind of floating around. So this geometry fragments and incises the space, and you can see that the art direction has this fineness, this sharpness to every join, and that these level design choices allow that to be shown. Uh, you can talk about um, that it's not just a visual metaphor. The, it's the difference between the player working their way from mass to mass to mass to mass versus hopping around a fragment in space. Uh, I know obviously the shot games are shooters and Mirror's Edge is a traversal game and Olympic diving is something totally different altogether. Uh, but I still think it's worth like, considering how you adapt these principles from one game to another. Um, so, one of the last things I want to sort of talk about is that for me, the consideration of architecture in games isn't about like, do you, does your door work the way a real door does? Um, it's a question of like, does, because real architecture doesn't look very realistic always either. Um, it's a question for me of um, like space and material, not necessarily realism. Um, sometimes it feels like games aim for a kind of solidity, like a need to fight the virtualness. Um, but for me, it's like, it's a question more about consistency um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do here. I think a big part of what many, what's, makes architecture captivating is that by compositing disparate materials with the same tonal goal, you kind of reveal the truth about like the universe and its latent possibilities. And I think that's true of games as well, because when you uh, show how all these different layers can achieve the same thing, you kind of tell something about the space that you're creating and the kind of like vision that you have. And so when I say detail, I don't mean something out of Detail Magazine. Um, it's not whether it's familiar. It's like, is the massing doing something besides separating one bit of content from another? How do you think about the way you're using mass? Is it a solid wall with, hol with holes punched in? A dividing plane that's been thickened in places? A frame within a space? What metaphor do you use um, to kind of express what you're trying to achieve at that level? I want you to use form the way that I use form, to create identity, to emphasize material, and to create a coherent whole that has a distinct atmosphere. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering how you feel about repetition in the architecture in games, such as modular um, levels, level design, and using the same concrete texture for every piece of concrete in the one game. Um, I have interesting feelings about that because I work a lot in procedural design. Um, so for me, like repetition is, yeah, it's a device that you can use within that, and that's like one parameter that you can set. And it gives, it can be used for familiarity, or like as you, as I'm sure you're criticizing more that it can be used for boredom, and like it can cause boredom and that kind of thing. Or yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm wondering how you think it can be used usefully, like to to the best advantage. Um. Yeah, for sure, because it depends like what you're trying to create. Like, If you want something to constantly echo something throughout um, your game, then it can do that. Uh, if you think about cities that have like really consistent architecture where it's often like everywhere throughout, um, it creates a sense that the people in that world 
had a particular material that they had to use and that they evolved to use that in a particular way and that they've gone about it and just done it everywhere. Um, if you go to like Santorini, um, it's really like the Greek island, it's very like that, like every house is constructed in the same way because they only had like limited options. Um, so that's kind of, to me, that's what they would say architecturally about a world. Um, but yeah. Thank you. No worries. Hi. Hi. Hi, Dean. Thanks for your talk. Uh, you were saying you're, you want to apply uh, consistency and so forth. So you're saying that normally in video games right now, we're, do you, would you think that we're a bit limited in our way of thinking of designing in terms of architecture, that we should apply more of the uh, current architectural field towards game design? I'm not sure about that. It was more that I'd never heard it expressed in this way. Mm -hmm. Like, I can definitely see it happening in games. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if people are limited, but I don't know if there's the design emphasis on that. Uh -huh. um, because there's very much, like, particularly in games that have a very, uh, there's like a very strong um, uh, tradition of level design uh, for particular purposes that's less experiential. So maybe like for more experiential games, this is more relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Something to think about. Thanks. No worries. Hi, you mentioned the documentary about city planning earlier? Oh, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. So, thank you very much. Yeah. It's really, really good. You should watch it. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? No? Okay, what do I do? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, everyone, 440 is the next talk. Thank you very much for coming.